Friends, meet Dana. Hey guys. Dana is a proper car guy I met here at the Miami Auto Show. He caught me shooting some cool stuff, which you're gonna see in a bit, but you told me an incredible story. Here at the Miami Auto Show, walking around, yeah. then I see the DeLorean. Yeah. Classic car. I've never seen one in person. Saw a motor man, like, you know what? Kill two birds with one stone. You're not gonna kill me, are you, Dana? No, sir. Okay, I just wanna make sure, yeah. <laughs> See why I like this guy? So you had yep. to come to a new car show to see a classic car you've never seen in person. Exactly, and I'm in the car business. How crazy is that? Okay, this is why you and I are gonna walk around the show together. Let's do it. So full disclosure, Miami is not a huge auto show. It's not like Paris that kicked off this week as well, New York, Los Angeles, or Detroit. As such, it does not get its fair share of concept cars. However, I did roam the hall and found one that was very interesting, although I wouldn't call it a car. It's more of a hybrid between a motorcycle and a car. It is the Toyota iRoad, and what it is is a city car concept. And if I'm reading the tea leaves correctly, it's more of a city car shared concept. So it's very similar to that uh, scooter that has the wheels in the front, that Piaggio scooter with the wheels in the front and the one wheel in the back, and it kind of leans into turns. So it has the handling characteristics of a motorcycle, but some of the stability of a sort of car, being it's got the two wheels in the front. It's different than the Renault Twizy, which has four wheels, but the size is kind of there. This one's just a little bit smaller, holds one person, and this, there is this card reader on the back. So I would think this is a shared car concept for the city, like you roll up to it, you pull your phone out or a credit card, and it releases the vehicle into your custody and you go ride it around much like those bird scooters. Shared or not, motorcycle or not, I think we should drive this thing on the show. And now for something completely different, mid-size pickup trucks. This is a segment you and I normally don't look at. It's not because I'm not interested in them. I'm actually quite interested in the segment as a business. And if you're to look at over the past couple of years, Toyota has owned this pretty much to itself, well, and Nissan as well, if you think about it, uh, since General Motors and Ford abandoned it years ago. But then GM came back in with the Chevy and the GMC and seems to be doing pretty well, especially to the point where they brought a diesel. So Ford has followed suit. We've seen this over the past couple of years as they've shown this. So this is nothing new. But what's interesting here is this one's kind of a special one in that it's an extended cab FX4, so like the super duper off-road model, but it's a 2.3 EcoBoost with a 10-speed automatic. So I'm focusing on this here in this little episode because I want to pose two questions. Number one, is that the right combination of engine and transmission for reportedly the off-road model? And number two, out of this now growing segment, the Chevy, the GMC, the Ford and obviously the Toyota, which was the perennial favorite for many years. Which one of these do you feel is going to be the, the clear winner here? Because if you look at the, the full size, it's clearly the Ford. If you were to pull out the F-150 business, that alone would be like one of the top three car companies in the world. Let me know in the comments below. New cars, mildly interesting. Classic cars, far more interesting. And how many times have I told you, we don't buy a car, we buy a story. And I'm gonna show you some classic cars here at a new car show. Very thankful for that. But the one that has the best story is clearly this one behind me, the 1958 Mercedes-Benz 300D Adenauer. Now think about when this car was new, at least a year after it, what happened 90 miles south of here. As such, this car, the first and second owner, you may have heard of them. Uh, the first owner, Batista. But then let's just say when he lost his job, the second owner that kind of took over his job came and took this car as well. So here is one really good condition Mercedes that was owned by two heads of state. Guess you could say that.
I can no longer be quiet about this. If you've been watching the show for a while, you know I'm a huge GM fan because I grew up in a GM household, uh, Buicks and Chevy specifically. I've owned a couple of classic Pontiacs, and I love what Dave Leone and the guys are doing over at Cadillac. So I'm like, let's go GM. However, this insults me, and here's why. It is a perfectly attractive crossover. It is a baby buggy. It is better looking than most out there. The design is good. It's got a cool daylight opening, and the interior is actually pretty cool. However, I am offended that you call this a Blazer. A Blazer is a body-on-frame truck that has some off-road capabilities, much like a 4Runner. The market is littered with crossovers that are front-wheel drive-based cars. Why come out with another one? That's only two rows, I'd like to point out, when you already have what? They had the Traverse, the Trax, the Equinox. So this is the fourth of another crossover, granted a growing segment, but I guess if you want this, great. Product planners probably want this. The business people, the bean counters at GM probably want this. But don't call it a blazer. This is Charlie. You guys don't know Charlie. He's old. That's why he wears glasses. Yeah, I have to. Yeah, so tell us, what was your favorite of the show? Uh, my favorite, my absolute favorite that was, was the, show. the Ram 1500 e-torque. The fact that every single Ram 1500 now is a mild hybrid yeah. is really amazing. Up to 1200 uh, RPMs you're using most of the time you will only be using the electric motor yeah um gives you about 10 percent extra um Fuel mpg yeah. yeah yeah i mean i think that's pretty cool but the fact that every single 1500 mm. is now and that includes the hemis it's not just a pentastar motor mm -hmm. that's crazy what else here that's cool um you know they took away they took away their exhibit for exotic cars d collection which is a big dealer down yeah. here in south florida used to run a whole hall of just exotics yeah they're not here this year Last year, this show got wiped out by um, Hurricane Irma. Yeah. And this year, they're sort of rebuilding it again, but I'm shocked to see no exotic cars mm -hmm. in such an incredible market for them. That's an incredibly um, good point. Yeah, I mean, you know, but the, the auto shows are what they are today, so it's very different. But now to the more pedestrian classics like muscle cars, 1970 AMX. Not really an AMC guy, but I can respect it. This is more my speed, a 1960 Corvette. Stunning color, especially with the red interior. But I do have to take my hat off to the folks who uh, put this display together at the Miami Auto Show because classics are not just the usual here. It is now a three-row mid-80s station wagon. This is a GMA body. Specifically, this is the Pontiac version, the 6000 LE. It's even got the wood on the side. You know what? Let's take a vote. How many of you would rather drive this over one of these nondescript blob baby buggies like this Acura over here? But then they did some other cool stuff here. My favorite of the display is this 1971 C3. Love the color. It is a four-speed, thankfully. These are starting to get some love. These Volvos, man, they used to be, what, five grand. But one in that condition, I'd say somewhere between 15 and 20 at this point, so not so cheap. And then back there, they got a DeLorean, of course. And then the MGB in perfect condition over there. And then another really cool car they have over there is, a, is an IROC with the factory T-tops. That was, what, $15,000 new back in the day in 87 when that came out. That car in that condition is probably like 30, 35 grand. And then continuing the communist theme that we started over here with the Mercedes, look at that just right in the corner. Okay, checking back in with Dana. You had hey a chance guys. to walk the floor? Yep. What's your favorite? RS5. R you had to go with the Audi. I had to go with you the had Audi. To go. I'm a Chevy guy, but look at this. The color is awesome. They don't call it Battleship Gray, but I like the Battleship Gray. I concur. Now, what do you personally drive? I drive a Corvette. I, okay, not only does he shell, sell these things, but this man eats his own dog food. <laughs> I, okay, respect. Thank you for joining me and showing me the show today. Welcome. And now, not just cars, propulsion systems. So way back in, what, March, you and I drove the full internal combustion engine version of the Kona. And Mike O'Brien told us he's going to come out with a full battery electric version. There it is. We're going to drive it next week. So expect episodes a couple weeks thereafter. What's interesting is not that that is here. What's interesting is that this is a B-segment vehicle, full electric from, what, the fifth largest car company in the world. And most likely you will see the same thing on the Kia side. However, 
they're feeling, at least Mike thinks, there is enough room to have a bigger vehicle. So a D-segment vehicle that is also fully electric. Yes, it's an electric motor that, that actually runs the vehicle, but how the energy is stored is not just this battery at the bottom of the car, this is a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle. So it's an interesting strategy in that, yeah, there's two different sizes of vehicles, but the way in which they store the energy is the change. But here's the, the downside. It's limited to certain markets. Like, I don't really see this selling in Miami because I don't see an infrastructure for it. This would be more a New York, like Oregon, California type sale where that could go everywhere. I'm going to turn this over to you guys as a question. Would you be open to a vehicle fuel cell hydrogen or would it be better just to say take the propulsion system out of that and put it into the Santa Fe? So let's end a little tour of the Miami Auto Show with something you and I never really look at and that is Lincoln's. If we rewind back to the New York Auto Show, Lincoln took the wraps off this, the Aviator, their mid-size SUV, and there's really no nice way to put this. They knocked everybody on their ass from a design perspective. Like, even me, I was blown away by, A, the design, but more importantly, how they hid the proportions of a mid-size SUV. If you think this competes with, like, an X5, a GLE, a Cayenne, those types of vehicles, here it looks longer, lower, and wider, almost like a station wagon, which is more my preference. Uh, they did share some details back then that it's going to be based on a rear-wheel drive platform, actually a little bit behind the scenes. Uh, in New York, I literally crawled underneath the car, I shouldn't be telling you this, to see if it was indeed a rear-wheel drive platform. And uh, that one was, it was a very early prototype, so the platform underneath the car was not the rear-wheel drive platform, it was one just to move the car like five miles an hour onto a show stand and off a show stand, which is what all manufacturers do. So basically it was a China doll and really I learned nothing underneath the car. But enough in New York, back to Miami, and the question as to why that aviator is important. Well, you may have noticed there's a plug coming out of it or really going into it. That is the plug-in hybrid version and it kind of follows suit when you think about the BMW, the Porsche, the Mercedes, all of them have introduced a plug-in hybrid version of their fancy, like mid-size sport utility vehicle. So that says a couple of things for Lincoln, it says a couple of things for the Aviator, but it also says a couple of things for the show. Like this is the Q8. Not that it's an introduction or reveal here, but it's kind of like a, an exclamation point, an impact, a reason why this show is interesting over other regional shows because of the market around it, South Florida. This is a vehicle that is important, as is that Aviator. But what I didn't expect was to see classic cars, which was my favorite, as well as not one but two concepts. I would consider that plug-in hybrid a concept car. And the Toyota, is it a car or really is it a third of a concept car? I'll let you guys decide. This has been an interesting exercise coming to the Miami Auto Show. Clearly, the 71 Corvette was my favorite. I'm going to turn this around to you guys and ask you what is your favorite. Let me know in the comments below or via our social media, Motoman TV on Word, Motoman TV on Word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And with that, I think I need to get out of town here and go to my favorite Cuban joint, which is about five miles to the east. Till I see you next time. Bis später.